Welcome to church. God bless you. Good morning, and allow me to echo the words of my daughter in saying, Welcome to church. God bless you. Now, this is not church as we're used to or as we would prefer, but it's what we're doing for today. Uh, everything is okay. We're all feeling well. But there are enough concerns around us that we felt it is in everyone's best interest, in the interest of all of our safety, to not meet in person today. This will give us some time to do some extra cleaning and sanitization to make sure that we can continue to meet in person, that we don't have to shut down more long term. So that being said, we still intend to have a beautiful time of worship. We've provided some songs, and Lieutenant Emma will be bringing the words shortly. Our call to worship, I'm going to read some words from the song that would have been our opening song together, I'll Not Turn Back, song number 649 in the songbook. Some of the words say, If doors should close, then other doors will open. The word of God will never be contained. His love cannot be finally frustrated by narrow minds or prison bars restrained. And the chorus says, I'll not turn back, whatever it may cost. I'm called to live, to love, and save the lost. Let that be so for us this morning and always.
Today's scripture reading comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 14, and I'm going to be reading from the English Standard Version. Again, that's Exodus 14. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of Pihathora, between Migdol and the sea, in front of Baal Zephon. You shall encamp facing it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say to to, of the people of Israel. They are wandering in the land. The wilderness has shut them in, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them, and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And they did so. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed towards the people, and they said, what is this we have done, that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made ready his chariot and took his army with him, and took six hundred chosen chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh king of Egypt, and he pursued the people of Israel, while the people of Israel were going out defiantly. The Egyptians pursued them all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and his horsemen and his army, and overtook them encamped at the sea by Pihathora, in front of the Baal Zephon. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, 
Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to bring to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Verse 13. And Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. The Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they shall go in after them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host, his chariots and his horsemen. Verse 18. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. Then the angel of God, who was going before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was the cloud and the darkness, and it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. Verse 21. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land and the waters were divided and the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left the Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea all Pharaoh's horses his chariots and his horsemen and in the morning watched the Lord in the pillar of fire and of cloud looking down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. Verse 28. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen. Of all the hosts of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea, not one of them remained. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. Who here lives a normal life? Would you consider yourself to be normal? So normal is, it's a pretty simple word that we allow to define many things. Am I right? In the dictionary, it can be defined as conforming to a standard, usual, typical, or even expected. So I'd say 10 out of the 12 months of 2020 were anything but normal. Am I right? The pandemic hit and nothing was usual, typical, or expected anymore. There was fear, there was death, and there was a lot of heartache. So I want you to take a second and literally picture 2020 for yourself. Think about what it looked like for you. All right, you got that picture in your head? So I'm sure you've seen it, but over the last few weeks, we've been anticipating the new year. There's been a lot of Facebook and Instagram posts about 2021 bringing us back to normal. I know you've seen them. In some ways, I think that a lot of people hope that 2021 would kind of rescue us from the pandemic, right? And bring about health and peace. 
I think some people thought that things would instantly be better because it's not 2020 anymore. Let's not kid ourselves. We've all thought that, right? This past Wednesday, though, it showed us that that wasn't true, right? Now, I'm not here to talk politics, but that's a perfect example, right? Now, the Lord has really been pressing on my heart that we aren't supposed to just go back to normal. I'm not saying that we're supposed to live in the chaos, like forever, but I believe that God is calling us to greater things in 2021. Amen? So this morning, we're going to dive deep into Exodus 14, where the Israelites crossed the Red Sea. So first, panic. Our story this morning begins with a word from the Lord. The Israelites escaped from Pharaoh. They were being led by Moses. They'd begun their journey only a few days right before we get to chapter 14. So the first four verses were words that are spoken by the Lord to Moses. He gave specific instructions of where they needed to camp out and even which direction they needed to face. He's very specific. He told Moses that Pharaoh would say that they were wandering in the land and that the wilderness has shut them in. The Lord tells Moses that he planned to harden Pharaoh's heart and that he would absolutely chase after them, all the Israelites. He would hotly pursue them. He follows it up by saying that he would get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts so that the Egyptians will know that he is the Lord. I love that he follows up by saying, and they did so. So once Pharaoh got word that they were gone, it basically says that he was filled with deep regret. He became angry and put together his army so that he could pursue them, just as the Lord had spoken. He gathered his chariots and took his army with him. He also took 600 chosen chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. It's in that moment that the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. The armies and chariots overtook the Israelites and they were encamped by the sea. So as Pharaoh got closer, looking at verse 10, they begin to panic a little bit. They turn their gaze upward and as they are, they notice that the Egyptians are starting to gain ground and they're pretty close. The closer they get, the more panicked the Israelites are. So you know how I like to like think about this when I'm preaching. And so I can just picture myself, you know, we've been through this hard time and we started our journey and Moses says, okay, you need to go over here in the Lord. You know, they, they say that we need to go over to this specific spot. Like, okay, that's fine. I can do that. And as we're over there, we see the enemy coming. I would probably be like, what? You know, you're looking up and all of a sudden there is the enemy, man. So that's where they're at right now. They're, they're being hotly pursued. The closer they get, the more panicked the Israelites are. And can you blame them? They turn to Moses and ask him, why did you bring us out here? Is it because there's no graves in Egypt that you bring us all the way out to the wilderness to die? What have you done to us? Didn't we tell you to leave us alone that we would serve the Egyptians? We're better off serving the Egyptians than dying here in the wilderness. Now, those are some pretty tough words, right? But as we can see, they're afraid. They're in the middle of nowhere, literally nowhere, about to be clobbered by the Egyptians and are afraid they're going to die. Can you imagine, you know, coming out of there and here you are, you're about to die. Terrifying, right? You can see that they were filled with fear and regret. Like, why did we leave? We shouldn't have left. You hear their plea to the Lord and their anger with Moses. This is their moment where they wanted to turn back and give up. They were being pursued by the enemy. Every ounce of normal they had come to know over the last bit, it was gone and they were missing it desperately. So how often are we like this when God puts us in new situations? Do we panic and want to turn back to what's to what we know, like what's known? Or do we press on through the battle to get to the victory? How do we respond to being pursued? I want you to think about those this morning as we continue on. So I can't help but think, you know, as I'm picturing the beginning of this story about when Lieutenant and I were getting ready for training. 
So we had, you know, a whole, almost a whole year to pull our stuff together. You know, we had to pack up all our belongings. We had to uh, prepare our house and then we had to sell it. Then we had to move out to camp all while we had two-year-old Eden. So we knew that this was what the Lord had for us. And so it was like, okay, Lord, we're going to do this. And he honored and blessed every step of the way. But as we got to the day where we had to start training, Lieutenant and I pull in in the car and we get there and I look at him and I'm like, are you really sure this is where we're supposed to be? Are you sure that God has called us to this? And I'm panicking. Like, am I sure that this is what we're supposed to be doing? You know, we just gave up our whole life in Pittsburgh. Are you sure? You know, so I can imagine just how the Israelites felt You know, coming out of everything that you had known, everything that was normal, and going into the new. But as the Egyptians and Pharaoh were gaining ground on them, you know, they had panicked. And so as I compare myself, you know, I have to think like, would I have panicked? I don't know. But I want us to turn and look at our second point this morning, which is pursuit. So first was panic, and now we're going to look at pursuit. So Moses could tell they were panicking. So he tells them, fear not, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. So first he tells them to not fear, but he could tell like that wasn't enough. You can't just say fear not because he could tell they were afraid. So he continues to tell them to stand firm. He wants them to remember what the Lord had brought them through and to keep on moving. The final piece that really hits home for them, it's in verse 14. It says, the Lord will fight for you and you have only to be silent. Woo, let me read that again. The Lord will fight for you and you have only to be silent. Sounds like easier said than done, right? So the Israelites were being hotly pursued, and they were just told that the Lord would fight for them if they were only silent. When we get to verse 15, it begins with the Lord asking Moses, Why do you cry to me? He wanted the people of Israel to go forward. The Lord gave specific instructions. Moses was to lift his staff and to stretch out his hands above the sea. And so if you know me, I kind of have this visual picture in my head, like, you know, lifting his staff and his hands above. So that's all he had to do, and the sea would divide. Now, how amazing is that? Um, Just trying to picture it all, you know, and it's just, it's such a cool picture that comes to my head. You know, all he has to do is hold that and lift it up, and the sea is going to divide. That's pretty amazing, right? So can we just pause for a minute and kind of just take that in like, whoa. That's awesome. I love when God does that kind of stuff. If I were Moses, I honestly don't know how I'd feel though. I mean, what an incredible task that is. The Lord allowing me to part the sea. I can only imagine the look on the Israelites face. Like here they are being hotly pursued and then bam, the Lord tells Moses to, Moses to do this action and then the sea parts. Like that probably had to blow their mind, right? So if we're being honest, there's probably some of them that were still fearful though, right? They were being pursued by the enemy and here the waters part. So some of them were probably thinking like, are the waters going to come crashing on me? Like, you know, Moses led us out and, you know, towards this journey, but like, what is really happening? So some of them were probably afraid. Let's be honest. Um, There's probably some fear still in them. But the Lord goes on to tell Moses in verse 17 that he will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will pursue the Israelites into the water. So one aspect that I love in each step of the way, the Lord is revealing the why to Moses. You know, Moses tells the people what the Lord says to do, but the Lord makes it abundantly clear to Moses the why, you know, because he was so connected Moses was so connected to God, and so he actually told them the why, which I think is pretty incredible. And so by hardening the hearts of the Egyptians, they would hotly continue the pursuit into the water, where the Lord can show his power and show them that he is the Lord. 
It'll give him the glory over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. Now, isn't that incredible? So when it feels like we're being pursued and God gives us words of hope, do we hold to them? When we go through times of trial and pursuit, are we aware of his voice? Now, I really want you to think about this, that this morning as we continue on in the story of Exodus 14. You know, we've looked at, we've looked at the panic and we looked at the pursuit. And the final P that I want to look at this morning is power. That's the third one. So while we see God's power throughout the story, and I could pause here and just, you know, you could name them off. But, you know, while we see God's power throughout the story, he really shows it at the beginning of verse 26. He tells Moses to hold his staff above his head, to raise his arms, and that the waters would come over the Egyptians. So at this point, the Egyptians can see it coming. They know something's about to happen, and there's nothing they can do. You know, they're trying to get off their chariots to flee, and the Lord has allowed their wheels to go even slower so that they can go nowhere. They know it's coming, and there's nothing that they can do. There's no escape for them. The Lord showed his power as the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen. None of the host of pharaohs remained. It's in these moments that the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea, and they made it out alive. Isn't that incredible? The Lord saved Israel from the hand of the Egyptians as they were dead in the sea. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians, which allowed the people to fear the Lord and believe in him. Now, there is one part that I want to back up to because it really shouldn't be missed. And if you were following along the scripture, You're probably thinking like, um, Lieutenant, you missed a part there and you can't just kind of pick and choose what scripture you want to do. And you're right. So I want to, I purposely left this for the end and I want to come back to it. It was on purpose, I promise. And so at the beginning of their journey across the sea, there was an angel that went before them. Now, I don't know if you caught that part, but Verse 19 states that the angel of God was going before the host of Israel. It moved and went behind them, which means that it had been in front of them prior to that. The pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. There was the cloud and the darkness, and it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. The pillar moving between the Israelites and the Egyptians indicated that God had become a wall of protection between his people and their enemies. Isn't that incredible? You know, if you're looking at this whole story and you're not really like looking into the details, you could easily miss this part. Um, But I love it that the Lord literally puts himself as a wall between his people and their enemy. He allowed the pillar to give light to the Israelites so that they could see their journey ahead and keep going. But it casted darkness to the Egyptians as another way to kind of trip them up as they didn't understand the ways of God. So they got the darkness. So as Moses lifted his hands with a staff, it made way for a large burst of wind, which cleared the way for the Israelites. Incredible, right? So while we can see the Lord's power and strength in the smallest and the largest of details in this story, I can't help but think how the Israelites were reacting. While there was probably a tiny bit of fear and awe in them, they were probably pretty antsy. They would have heard heavy winds almost storm-like all night. You know, again, I get this picture going. You know, there's light and there's dark and you can feel these winds and you're kind of like, what is going on? So they're probably wondering what the Lord was going to do. They knew that he would save them and that he cared about them, but that didn't mean that they knew his timing or what exactly was going to happen. And I can't help but think this morning, how often do we fall into the same frame of mind? We're in hard times, even in the midst of fighting battles that no one knows about. We know the Lord is there and that he's going to save us. But our question turns to when. When will you save us, Lord? I know you can feel that this morning, right? So I know at the beginning of this sermon that I had you think about the word normal and how a pandemic has been 
anything but normal. Like the Israelites at the beginning of Exodus 14, we long to go back to what we know, right? I know I did. I wanted to go back to life before masks, before panic over hearing a cough, before losing friends to this disease. You know, Lieutenant and I were talking the other day and we were thinking back to the very beginning of March when this pandemic hit. And if we had known then that we would be in this, you know, we just thought this thing was gonna be two weeks. And I know a lot of you thought the same, like, okay, if I can just make it through the next two weeks. And I remember thinking about Eden schooling and we started with theme days. We had a music day, an I spy day. Like we put so much effort in. And then we realized like, this isn't just going away. You know, this was quote unquote, the new normal. So I know, you know, we've all been there. And the reality is that I don't think any of us desire any of us for another 2020. But I have heard over and over the longing to go back before the p- pandemic and going back to this idea of normal. And so what I want you to walk away with today is that the Lord doesn't always call us to go back. Like the Israelites, he calls us to better things. Now, I'm not saying this is the beginning of our wilderness because believe me, the last 11 months sure have felt pretty wilderness-like. But he has called us to move forward, just like he did to the Israelites. He is calling us to keep moving. Like the Israelites, he wants us to hear his still, small voice in 2021 and to move forward. Will things ever go back to the way they were before? I don't know. But you know what? We don't have to fear. Do you hear that this morning? We don't have to fear. We know from verse 14 that the Lord will fight for you. You only have to be silent. And saying that this morning, you know, I do not find it easy to be silent. If you know me, you know I love to talk. But I am learning over the last few months that if I really want to continue to grow and grow deep in God, I have to learn and practice to be silent. And that's not easy for me. So this morning, I hope if you take nothing else away, it's the fact that the Lord is willing to fight for you. He desires to spend time with you. And he may not ever bring back any kind of normal. And you know what? That's okay, because he is right there with us. And if you have been there on Sunday mornings over the last, I'd say like two or three weeks, you know that we've been singing the song Waymaker. And that has kind of become my theme song for the year. He is the way maker. And, you know, as I wrap this up this morning, I just, I want that song to kind of go with you this morning. As we part ways and you dive into your week, you know, I don't know what the Lord has in store for your week, but guess what? He already knows. He's right there with you and he is walking alongside of you. So I pray that you have a blessed week and that you will just turn everything in your hearts over to the Lord. Whatever's going on, maybe you have fear like some of the Israelites did. Maybe change and the idea of not going back to normal scares you. You know what? That's okay. If you turn that over to the Lord and just talk with him about it and then be silent and listen, I promise that you won't regret it. May God bless you this coming week. Stop.
stop working You never stop, you never stop working Even when I don't see it, you're working Even when I don't feel it, you're working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, you never stop working As we reflect on these words this morning, I'd like to send us out with a reading from Colossians chapter 3. It says, Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one of you has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen, and go with God.